I didn't think it would last this long. Like, we've always referred to it as a season, but seasons aren't supposed to last eight, nine months, a year. Seasons are supposed to be shorter than that. I, I think because I assumed it wasn't going to last as long as it has when it first happened and we weren't gathering together physically at our campuses, I started to preach in a way that was reactive, which is fine to do for a few weeks or a few months even, I think. As long as you're rooted in Scripture, it's, it's okay to occasionally say, you know what, we're going to stop what we thought we were going to do and we're going to apply what God's Word says to what's happening around us. And yet what I discovered after a few months of that it, is that it's exhausting to be reactive when every week things seem to change and every month things are different. And ultimately what we're committed to as a church is standing on God's word, but what we don't want to do is um, constantly look at God's word through the lens of culture. We want to look at culture through the lens of God's word. We, we, want, we want God's word to be our foundation. So when things are kind of being tossed and blown around by the wind, we want to have our compass out, the true north. And so one of the things we decided to do was just to spend a number of months going through the words of Jesus, verse by verse, in what's called the final discourse. John 14 through 16 is what we've studied since like July. We've just gone through to see what Jesus would say to his closest followers during a season of uncertainty. When he knows what they're going to face is suffering and struggle, it's going to be pain and persecution, what does he say to them? We've just gone verse by verse through these words of Jesus. And I think what we've discovered along the way is what they needed to hear, that's not entirely different than what we need to hear. The disciples were disillusioned. They thought things were going to go differently than they had gone. When they started following Jesus, they were assuming that Jesus as the Messiah was going to bring about change to the world, but they had an idea in mind of how that change would take place. And from their perspective, it was political. It was power. And this in large part is why earlier this same evening that we're studying, earlier in that same evening, Judas had left to betray Jesus. It's because Jesus wasn't doing things the way he thought they should be done. He wanted Jesus to change things but he was very focused on their temporary struggles and he wanted Jesus to use power. And it had only been a number of days earlier where Jesus had come in on the, on the triumphal entry and people had tried to crown him as a king, a political king. They were looking for a coronation and it's not that Jesus wasn't willing to wear a crown. It was just a different kind of crown than they wanted him to wear. It's a crown of thorns. And so he is preparing them for what it looks like to change the world, not from a political position of power, but from a place of servanthood, from a place of humility, from a place of love. And so the Bible tells us in Philippians 2 that our attitude, our mind, is to be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who made himself nothing, and he took on the very nature of a servant. Now from our earthly perspective, it doesn't seem like the way to change things. From our perspective, it seems that the way you change things is you force it. You take the mantle of power and you wear it. And yet Jesus resisted it again and again and again. He was coming to change the world, but he was changing it differently than many of his followers thought he would. And so he wants to reassure them wants to reassure them who he is, and that no matter what comes through those doors, no matter what they deal with, he is still God. He is still on the throne. And it seems to me that maybe what they need to be reminded of is what maybe we need to be reminded of this week. And so we come to the end of chapter 16. Next weekend we'll be in John 17, which is the prayers of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is going to show us how to pray when we feel overwhelmed with the circumstances of life. He's going to show us how to pray when God's will doesn't line up with our will. And he's going to pray for us in that prayer. We're going to study John 17 starting next week. But this week we're wrapping up chapter 16. And here's what Jesus says at the end of this conversation. Remember, they've been walking in the evening from the last supper in the upper room towards the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're almost there. And here's what Jesus says, starting in verse 28 of chapter 16. I came from the Father and entered the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. So he's being really clear. It says, then Jesus' disciples said, now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech. 
Jesus would often use parables, metaphors, to help the disciples think through the kingdom of heaven, to help the disciples understand who he is. But in this moment, without much time left, he's speaking real clear. He's saying, I came from heaven. My kingdom is not of this world. I came from heaven. Don't don't forget about that. Don't lose sight of that. Don't think that when this world doesn't go according to your plan or the way you think it should, that somehow I'm, I'm not in control. I'm in control. The earth is mine and all that is in it. And so Jesus says, I came from the Father. I'm going back to the Father. He's reassuring them. He's given them confidence because he knows. He knows that there's going to be the tendency in the upcoming days and months for them to to overthink things, to overthink what's happening, to overthink what might happen, and then to start to wonder, did we get this wrong? And so Jesus reminds them who he is. They say, finally, you're saying it very clearly. Verse 30, they say, now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. Doesn't mean they didn't have questions. They had questions. But they knew he knew the answer, even if he didn't give it to them. Like, their confidence was in him. They had questions, they would have more questions, but they knew he knew. And they said, this makes us believe that you came from God. So look, I, I promise you, after listening to this conversation that we've been study in the last three or four months, they had a lot of questions. Like their minds were racing with implications of what Jesus has said to them. But here they say to Jesus, nobody needs to ask you any more questions. Why? Because he is from God. He, he is the son of God. He loves them. He chose them. And this is the answer to 10,000 questions. Like when you feel overwhelmed in your thinking, when it just all feels like too much and you can't shut it off, the answer to 10,000 questions is that Jesus is God, he loves you, and he has chosen you, and he, he knows what he's doing. And so they start to have this confidence and courage that, that comes as Jesus just speaks to them very clearly. And then he ends the conversation with them in verse 33. Jesus says, before going into the garden to pray, he says, I've told you these things. This long conversation that we've had as we've walked along in the cool of the evening, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I've uh, titled this sermon, From Overthinking to Overcoming. From Overthinking to Overcoming, because we live in a culture of overthinking. This has been called the age of overthinking. Our minds are constantly being taken captive by what's happening around us or what might possibly happen to us. We, we are always being reminded of that. And so some of you have felt it in this season, like you felt it last night. Like this is how you spent your extra hour of sleep, not sleeping, but lying awake in bed and thinking through implications and wondering what's going to happen this week. And we just have had more trouble than ever, I think, kind of shutting things off. Overthinking what's happened to us and what might happen to us. And then we get caught up in thinking what other, about what other people are thinking about. And that's kind of what Twitter is. People share their thoughts and then you think about other people's thoughts. And, and we'll have a ton of that this week, election week. You think, yeah, I mean, like, a lot of people are going to overthink and then overshare what they've been thinking over. And then we'll find ourselves overthinking what they've been thinking about. And it's just, this, it's just this cycle. So, you know what, let me, for those of you who are watching uh, in other countries, uh, this week for us in the United States is an election week. So there's just a lot going into that that is causing us to, to think. And it's constantly being triggered Right? Like, it doesn't matter when we turn on the news or when we're going through social media. This is what people are talking about and thinking about. And, and if you drive through neighborhoods, you got one neighbor with this political party represented on a sign and another neighbor with the other political party represented. And there's just, there's just a lot of that going on in our minds. And, and because it's during a pandemic, it's all kind of escalated And when you feel isolated, isolation leads to overthinking, and then overthinking brings about all kinds of anxiety. Um, I was researching just some classic symptoms of overthinking. 
agitation, anger, annoyance, uh, oversensitivity, like overthinking leads to oversensitivity. There's physical issues, insomnia, blood pressure and circulation problems, hypertension, migraines. And so to one degree or another, a lot of us are feeling it in this season. And Jesus says, I've told you what you need for peace. And yet we, in our desperation, keep trying other solutions. And so you do some research on this and you'll find that this year, alcohol consumption is up over 50%. In fact, more than 250% up when it comes to online sales of alcohol. You'll find that porn use is somewhere north of 40% increased over last year. The percentage of, of prescriptions to treat, anti, to, to treat anxiety, anti-anxiety prescriptions is up over 34% over last year. And so we recognize that there's this unease. We recognize this tension. We can feel like the, the wind and the waves tossing us back and forth. And we just have a hard time shutting our minds off. We're constantly overthinking. And so I, I want to talk about how we find that peace. But first, I, I really want to, um, I want to put some skin on overthinking. Because we, we talk about it, and yet it's, it's not always easy to identify what is causing it or what it looks like when we do it. So um, this is what overthinking looks like, or this is what causes us to do it. Of constantly comparing ourselves to others. And so we're always looking at other people's lives and feeling like we're missing out, always looking through that lens of what other people are experiencing and our minds just get going. We compare our evening out, we compare our Halloween costume, we compare our collection of candy, we compare our marriage, our vacation plans, we, we compare our homes, our cars we drive, we, we just are constantly in our minds, comparing ourselves to other people. And, and the Apostle Paul warns us about this in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. He just warns us about the spiritual danger of living that way. He says, look, we don't dare do that. We don't dare compare ourselves to each other because when we do, it just takes our minds captive. We get consumed, we get consumed with it. And we compare ourselves to other people. And the whole system is rigged right now to take your mind captive in this way. Um, how many of you have seen on Netflix and you know, at all of our campuses, how, how many of you have seen the uh, documentary called The Social Dilemma? By show of hands, raise your hand. Okay, if you haven't seen it, it's your homework for this week. Watch The Social Dilemma documentary on Netflix. It's pretty interesting when you get a picture of how the whole system is rigged. Like there are these complex and evolving algorithms that are all designed to take your thoughts captive, like to grab your mind and then not let go. I was uh, reading, you know, one of the quotes out of that documentary it comes from a guy who um, was the CEO of Pinterest. Uh, he was a tech developer, and, and he talked about that. Even though he knows how the system works, he was, he was still getting caught up in it, couldn't shut it off. He said, he said he would go home and his two young sons would come to him clamoring for attention, but he would find himself in the pantry with the door shut on his phone, scrolling. Here's the way he says it. He said, even knowing what was going on behind the curtain, I still wasn't able to control my usage. So our minds are constantly comparing to one another, seeing what we are missing out on. A second way that we overthink is this preoccupation being preoccupied with perfection. Where our minds are constantly thinking about how something needs to be better than what it is. And, and some of you look at all of life through the lens of perfection. You look at yourself that way, but you look at other people that way, like at any given time, you could tell the people in your life 10 things that they should do differently. Like you have your list, even if it's not written out. A, a test to see if this is you is uh, when you decide to put up the Christmas tree and decorations this year, okay? When it's time to get out the Christmas tree and to decorate the Christmas tree, ask yourself, do other people want to do that with you? <laughs> like when it's time, does the family gather around and say, I want to help? Or do they kind of recognize that no, that's, that's only for you to do? 
And some of you, like, you let the kids help or you let your spouse help, but then you fix it after they go to bed. Like, you, you let them hang up the ornaments and then you go to bed and you're just, you're just laying awake in bed thinking about how uneven the tinsel is and, and, and how unbalanced the ornaments are and you can't not fix it. So you get up, fix everything, kids get out of bed the next morning, like what happened? The elf on the shelf came in and fixed. <laughs> the elf on the shelf's a bit of a perfectionist and you, you're blaming the elf on the shelf for your perfectionistic tendencies and, 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 and this is what, you know, a lot of us do this in different ways where we find our identity and our self-worth and how good of a job we do. We start projects, but we don't finish them because there's new projects that have to start and we're never quite satisfied with how this one ended up. And so we keep it going and just kind of constantly thinking about what needs to change. The Bible talks about the sufficiency of God's grace. That it, it's enough. And yet for a lot of us, it's a struggle to have that when we look at our lives, when we look at what's happening around us, constantly preoccupied with uh, perfection. Number three, we're overthinking when we um, find ourselves ruminating but not resolving. Like we think about things, but we don't do anything about it. Right? Like you're laying awake in bed and your mind is racing with different challenges or struggles or problems, but you never get to the resolving part. Like you never stop and think, okay, well, here's what I need to do or here's who I need to ask help from, like it never gets that far. Sometimes it's because you can't do anything about it. Like it's out of your control, but it doesn't keep you from ruminating on it. Like you keep thinking about it. It's especially true in this season with the pandemic and the political elections coming up. Like there's so much to think about, but there's, it sometimes feel, feels like there's so little that we can do. And so we just give our minds over to ruminating without, without really being able to resolve. Um, here's another one. This is a big one. We're overthinking when we find ourselves um, looking back and imagining if only. And, and so you spend your time thinking back about something that happened and imagining how different your life would be now if it would have happened differently. You're looking back at your life through these if only lenses. Imagining what would be different if, if only, I don't know what's going through your mind. If only you wouldn't have said yes to that date. If only you wouldn't have taken that first drink. If only you would have moved to a different neighborhood. If only you would have gone to a different college. If, if only. If only your parents would have, if only your spouse would, and, and you, you look back on it, and, and from your perspective, as you just think about it and think about it, life would be so different now if only you would have done something different then. So sometimes you look back and you say, if only with a sense of regret, like you own it personally. And sometimes it, it's more with a sense of bitterness, like it's somebody who hurt you and did something to you, and you're it's constantly getting triggered and you're constantly thinking how much happier you would be if it wasn't for what that person did. And so what are we doing? We're, we're thinking about something we can't do anything about. But our minds get taken captive by looking back and saying, if only. On the other side of that, we are overthinking when we look ahead and we ask what if. So here, here's how this works. We, we look back and imagine if only. And whenever we say if only, we must almost always imagine best case scenario. My life would be so much better now if it would have gone differently then. When we look ahead and we overthink, we think in terms of worst case scenario. It hasn't happened yet, but we play it out what might happen, happen with what if situations. What could possibly go wrong? So there's this uh, whole f field of journalism where it has become, you know, you know this, but it's become incredibly popular where news stories, <laughs> and just pay attention to it this week, like news stories don't tell you about what happened or what's happening, but they speculate as to what might happen. It's clickbait, but it works because our minds, we kind of have this preoccupation of 
with what might possibly happen. And so it's called speculative journalism. And you just pay attention to this. How many stories in the news are not based on something that happened, but on something that, that might happen? And it's exploiting our kind of what-if obsession. Isaiah 26, verse 3 Isaiah says to God, listen, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind stays focused on you because they trust in you. So the question, who do we trust in? Who do we trust in for peace? But it's a struggle for us, like our minds are just always racing and then we end up kind of um, <laughs> like piling on our if-only questions with our what-if questions. And then our lives just kind of become that. You just look at everything that way. Well, what if, what if I don't get married? What if I get married and think, if only I was single? What if I get married, but I married the wrong person? Well, what if I get married and realize I've married the wrong person and I... I, I, the person I was supposed to marry went to a, a different college, but I didn't go to that college because I stayed up too late the night before the ACT, uh, putting the Christmas tree together, and, and now I went to the wrong college. If only I'd gone to the right college, I would have married the right person, but I went to the wrong college and married the, the wrong person. And if I, married the, if I married the wrong person, doesn't that mean I have the wrong kids? I mean, isn't that, I, mean, I don't remember how algebra works exactly, but it, the wrong, if you marry the wrong person, doesn't that, doesn't that mean the kid is wrong? And if I have the... I have the right person and the right kid, then what if, I, what if I give the kid the wrong name and the kid goes to the right school, but then people make fun of him because why would you, why would you, do, that to your, why would you do that to your kid? Why not just go with something normal? And, and, and then you think, well, what about my, my job? What if I would have just moved to a different town? If only I would have lived in a different town, I would have had different opportunities, but now I'm stuck in this town, I'm stuck with this job, and, and I... I can't quit. What if I always have this job? And I'm always thinking, if only I had a different job. And if I had a different job, then maybe things would be a lot easier for us. But I can't think about that now because I've, I've, got, I've got a house payment. I've got health insurance. I've got a car payment. I've, I've got a, a, a coffee habit to support. I, I've, got kid, I've got a kid to give, put in braces. Like I, what, if, what if I don't have enough money to put my kid in braces and my kid's going to marry the wrong person and have the wrong kid, which is going to leave me to have the wrong grandkids? And it's this vicious cycle and our minds just go off. And, and, and you really don't have time to be thinking about that because you know how many texts you haven't replied to? Like right now? And, and one of those people is your mom. Like what are you doing? It's your mom. Reply, reply, to, her, reply to her text. And you know how many times you've touched your face since you walked in here? Like, I can see you. It's constant. All of y'all, always touching your face. And, and what about when you were at the grocery store yesterday? Do you know how many people got within six feet of you? And, and our mind just goes and goes and goes. And, and Jesus knew that this was going to be a struggle for the disciples. In the days, the weeks, the months ahead, that they were just going to be thinking about everything that had happened, and it's not going how they thought it would. They were going to be overwhelmed by overthinking. And so Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. That you may have peace. And this word, I don't know, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing it triggered something for the disciples because it wasn't that long ago where they were all in the boat. And they were traveling at night, and a storm came upon them unexpectedly and it was a severe storm and the waves are crashing against the boat and coming over the edge and, and, and they're, they're panicky. They're freaking out. What if? What if we don't survive this? What if our boat doesn't make it? But, but Jesus is in the bottom of the boat and he's sleeping. And the disciples go and they wake up Jesus in the bottom of the boat and they say, don't, don't you care if we, we've been thinking about this and it seems like you must not care if we drown. Otherwise you wouldn't be sleeping. You'd do something about it. And, and Jesus says, you have little faith. And he gets up and he walks to the deck of the boat and he talks to the wind and the waves because he is their boss. And he says to the wind and the waves, peace, be still. And it is completely calm. And now Jesus is saying to his disciples, this is how you have that 
in your mind. This is how you have that in your, your heart. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. And, and so as we've studied this, just wanna finish by giving you the, what Jesus has told the disciples along the way here. Number one, if we're looking at chapters 14 through 16, here's what he's told them to have peace. First thing he's told them again and again is be prepared. That's been a big theme of the final discourse. Be ready, don't get caught off guard. Don't think that just because you follow Jesus that you are somehow exempt from the storms of life. Where rain falls on the just and the unjust, so no matter what comes through those doors, don't freak out, don't say this isn't supposed to happen to me. Remember, we talked about it last week, it only lasts for how long? It's a little while. It's a little while. It's just a mist. It's here, and then it's not. So be prepared when it comes. You're gonna have some turbulence, but this isn't the final destination. So buckle up. Secondly, Jesus says to them again and again in different ways is keep perspective. This has been a significant theme of the final discourse. Keep perspective. I'm leaving but don't lose perspective, the Holy Spirit's coming. And it's better for you, don't lose perspective on this, it's better for you if I go and he comes. Because God in you is better than God with you. Don't forget that. And, and keep perspective on the fact that I'm leaving, that where am I going? I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm coming back. So keep perspective on that. Remember that ultimately you are citizens of heaven. So live on earth like citizens of heaven. And it just strikes me that maybe that is a really good reminder for us this week. To keep perspective. To remember that you are a citizen of heaven. That means that no matter who wins what election, we are confident in the king. We are confident in the king of kings. It, it means that no matter what happens, even if it's different than what we had prayed for or wanted or worked towards, that our citizenship is in heaven. Now, citizens of heaven, of course, of course that affects how we live here on earth. Like, if we're citizens of heaven, then, then we are not in despair when the turbulence comes, when things don't go how we hoped they would. As citizens of heaven, one of the things we pray is the Lord's Prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, God, may your, may your will be done where? On earth, as it is in heaven. So we're not just killing time, we're not just waiting in a waiting room, but we're praying and we're living out God's kingdom here on earth. We're praying, God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is one of the reasons I'm incredibly thankful that we live in a nation where we have the freedom to not just pray for God's kingdom to come, for his will to be done on earth. We have, we have the freedom to be a part of that. Like, by voting, we have the opportunity to not just pray for the kingdom to come. We have an opportunity to make a difference in answering that prayer. And this is so significant when it comes to understanding ourselves as citizens of heaven. That we're not just praying for God's will to be done, but that we, to the extent that we can, we are making a difference for his kingdom to come, for his will to be done on earth. That means, that means we don't just pray. We don't just pray for the, for the freedom to, to worship openly. We don't just pray for that. That we, to the extent that we can do something about it, we do. It, it, it means that we don't just pray for the, the poor and the oppressed to be taken care of and for them to have opportunities. We don't just pray for all people to be treated equal, for all people, regardless of race, to, to be treated as image bearers of God. We don't, just, we don't just pray for the protection of, of, of unborn children who are being knit together in their mother's womb. We don't just pray for those things. But to the extent that we have the opportunity, we, we live out the kingdom of heaven. We pray for God's will to be done. And then when he gives us opportunity to bring his will to earth, we live that out. But we understand that was so hard for the disciples to understand. But that does not, the kingdom of heaven does not come. Chuck Colson put it this way. The kingdom of heaven is not gonna arrive on Air Force One. That's right. The kingdom of heaven 
came not by Jesus wearing a coronation crown, but by wearing a crown of thorns. And for some of you, I know this is a struggle, and I understand. I, I, I think a book that might be helpful to you if you find yourself this week either feeling um, overly optimistic or too much in despair, a book that might be helpful to you is Chuck Holson's book called The Political Illusion. So in, in this book, The Political Illusion, you know, one of the cases he makes is that the big political illusion of our day is that there's a political solution for our most pressing problems. Like, we want to believe that. And it's not that that stuff doesn't matter. It's just understanding. It's understanding that it's not where we put our hope. Right? And, and I would say to those of you who are followers of Jesus, and, like, you believe in the good news of the gospel, and you believe that Jesus is your Savior, when, when you lose sight of your hope being in him, you're, you're not only embarrassing yourself as a Christian, you're embarrassing the rest of us. It's, it's undermining the entire gospel when you start treating a politician like a savior. Listen, our, our hope is not in political rhetoric. It doesn't mean that doesn't matter. Our hope is not in political rhetoric. Our, our hope is in the word of God. Our, our hope is not in political reform. It doesn't mean that political reform isn't necessary. It just means our hope isn't in that. Our hope is in spiritual revival. It, it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter who's in Washington, D.C. It just means that our hope isn't in Washington, D.C. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is who sits in the Oval Office, our hope is who sits on the throne. Right? That's, where we've, that's where we've put our hope, and we don't dare lose sight of it. We keep perspective as citizens of heaven that this is where our hope lies. Our hope lies, our hope lies in Jesus. And so Jesus has told them to be prepared, to keep perspective. Remember, your hope is found in him. And then he's told them to trust his presence. Like that's been a significant theme of the final discourse, to trust his presence, that the Holy Spirit will be in them and be with them every step of the way, that they are the vine, branch, he is the vine, abide in him, just stay connected, to trust his presence. And so here's how I kind of want to wrap this up. Overthinking, overthinking focuses on what, how, and when, and this is how many of us um, process. We look at the challenges and the struggles, of life, we look at what comes through those doors and we wanna know what's wrong, what are we gonna do about it, how, how are we gonna fix it, how are we gonna deal with it, when's it gonna stop, when are things gonna go my way, when will things go back to normal? So overthinking focuses on what, how, and when. Overcoming focuses on who. And this is what Jesus does for the disciples. He takes their their mind, their thoughts, and he says, get your thoughts off of who, or off of what, how, and when, and, and give your thoughts to who. Keep, keep your thoughts focused on me. Jesus says, I am the one who has, I am the one who has overcome. And so we want to do that together. One of the best ways to do that is in, in worship. When we worship God, it, it takes our anxious and overwhelming thoughts and shifts them over to the overcomer. And so we want to find peace, not in some political savior. We want to find peace in the power and the presence of Jesus. And, and look, Jesus, you know, he wasn't nominated. He wasn't appointed. He wasn't elected. So what's that mean? Well, it means he won't be impeached. It means that he... He can't be voted out. It means that his term limit is eternal. And, and you can't control him or label him. You can't pull him onto your side. Jesus isn't a socialist. He's not a capitalist. He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's the, he's the king of kings. And, and so you can't restrain his will or restrict his power or repeal his promises. You can't limit his jurisdiction. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and all that's in it. 
And you can't surprise him or catch him off guard or shock him like on Wednesday. God's not going to wake up and go, wait, what? Like that's not, that's not going to happen. There, there's not a, some Supreme Court decision where God turns to the Holy Spirit and says, what are we going to do now? There's not a new virus that gets discovered where God decides, I'm better mask up and social distance from these people. His decisions can't be overturned. His word is not overruled. Colossians says, he is in all things, and in him all things hold together. He is all present. He is all knowing. He is all powerful. And do not forget that God moves kings and queens and presidents and senators like pawns on a chessboard. You can't control him. You can't contain him. His will will be accomplished no matter what. And so we pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. But we pray to the one who has already, past tense in that verse, he has already overcome. Victory has already been won. And so we live with that kind of faith, that kind of confidence. We, Jesus says, take heart, be of courage, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. May we live like it, may we worship like it, may we sing like it, may we vote like it, may we treat other people like it, that he has already overcome. So we're gonna have a few minutes of worship where we just wanna shift our minds over to the powerful presence of God. We wanna give our thoughts over to him. So we're gonna have a few minutes of worship um, as our worship team comes at all of our campuses to lead us. Let me pray. So Jesus, I thank you that you are with us. I, I thank you that you have shown us what it looks like to live out your kingdom here on earth. And, and, and I know that just as it was in your day, that there are a lot of people in our day where it just, we still wanna do things our way. And Jesus, I'm just struck again and again when I read the gospels and I read letters to the churches and the New Testament, just how rarely your focus was on some immediate or political issue. That you just saw things so much more completely. So I pray that you would give us your eyes for this world. That we wouldn't wait passively, but that we would engage, that we would pray for your kingdom to come, and we would do everything we can to, to live that out. That we would have your attitude in the way we treat people and love people with humility, with a spirit of service. By putting others' needs ahead of our own and treating others better than ourselves. I, I pray, that Jesus, that this week would be a week where we could live out what it looks like for your kingdom to come to earth because of where we put our hope and how we live, no matter what comes through those doors. I pray that you would give us your peace in these next few minutes, that you would take our overthinking and that you would turn it to courage, the confidence in you, the one who has overcome. It's in your name we pray, amen.